Is HIV the cause of AIDS? If not, as Neville Hodgkinson of the London Sunday Times put it, then we will have witnessed the greatest medical scientific blunder of the 20th century. Nearly everyone has been affected by AIDS. Whether it's a friend or a lover, a business acquaintance, or even a perfect stranger, AIDS has had an impact on our entire culture. The dread hangs silently over society, and there's little hope on the horizon. It's time we ask ourselves some serious questions. Could we be on the wrong track with HIV? Have we jumped to conclusions that will only lead to a dead end? Are we willing to accept the truth, even if it means that our whole campaign against AIDS has been in vain. To understand just how HIV became the target of this international war on AIDS, we have to look back at how it all began, but set into motion the chain of events that many say misled objective science. Following the depression of the 30s and World War II, America emerged into a new era of technology and prosperity. We had more time for recreation and self-realization. Society began to change. Medical science had new breakthroughs. We conquered polio, the last great infectious epidemic of the modern world. Soon, new antibiotics cured everything from minor infections to venereal disease. With the invention of the birth control pill came the sexual revolution, freeing the public from age-old fears and taboos. Homosexuality, too, found more freedom of expression as gays came out of the closet and formed their own subculture. During the Vietnam era of the 60s, recreational drug use skyrocketed among the young and would continue to grow. Yet, we remained optimistic that we could solve all our problems through our new faith in science and technology. But before long, the unforeseen consequences of this new liberated lifestyle began to rear its ugly head. Silently in the lines, the bell began to toll. When the first reports of immune deficiency surfaced in 1981, among a small group of gay men in Los Angeles, it was believed to be a result of behavior unique to homosexuals. But all that changed when similar conditions started showing up in IV drug users and hemophiliacs. That set off an alarm. What had been called gay-related immune deficiency now appeared to be an infectious disease that might spread throughout the entire population. This threat of a deadly blood disease being spread by sexual contact was sensationalized by the media and enraged gay activists who demanded action from the government. Public health officials issued strong warnings that this new immune disease could be acquired sexually by anyone. Suddenly, immune suppression common to drug addicts, homosexuals, advanced TB patients, and scores of other diseases became linked together in a microbiological search for a common cause. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, was born. As the bathhouses in San Francisco closed and the fear of AIDS spread, the U.S. Department of Health came under heavy fire to find the cause and remedy quickly. The public was willing to believe science could provide a quick fix. So the funding began to roll in, and the huge army of virus hunters, who had been unemployed after the unsuccessful virus cancer program, went back to work. They now turned their full attention towards finding the cause and cure for AIDS. Scientists began to speculate that AIDS patients lack the ability to fight infection in blood due to a shortage of T cells that coordinate immunity. In the blood, there are two basic kinds of cells. The red blood cells that carry oxygen and nutrients to all the body, and the white blood cells that hunt down, kill, and destroy infecting bacteria and viruses. When an infection occurs, white blood cells must increase rapidly and produce antibodies to fight it off. They do this through the use of CD4 T cells that act like infection detectives. T cells identify invading viruses, then alert the B lymphocyte blood cells to produce antibodies which attack the infection. In a normal immune system, there are about 600 to 1200 of these T cells in one microliter of blood plasma. But in an AIDS patient, the number of T cells drops down below 200 and lower. This is what is believed to be the direct cause of AIDS. 
Even this is questionable, though, because many AIDS patients have few or no T cells and remain healthy. But one thing is certain. People with AIDS are losing the ability to generate a strong blood defense against opportunistic infections that constantly attack the body. So, as AIDS progresses, the victim becomes less and less capable of recovering from common diseases like pneumonia, tuberculosis, and the flu. Eventually, the immune system gives out altogether, and the body is ravaged by disease, resulting in death. The objective is clear. Stop what is killing T cells and weakening the immune system, and you have found the cure for AIDS. But what exactly is killing the T cells? Is it really HIV? In the beginning, a number of different causes were suggested. Drugs like heroin, cocaine, popper, barbiturates, and amphetamines had all been observed to harm the immune system. Also, malnutrition, repeated infection, overuse of antibiotics, and stress. But these behavior-related causes were politically incorrect with gay activists who wanted to distance themselves from the idea that AIDS might be self-inflicted and government-funded research programs needed money and promised results. So, the decision was made politically to abandon the behavior AIDS model for the infectious epidemic model, and the virus hunters pressed on, self-convinced that AIDS could be stopped by a vaccine or a treatment.